Good afternoon to some and good evening to others. Thank you for joining us for this special roundtable today, The Ethics of Authentic Casting in VoiceOver. I'm your moderator, Tanisha Nicole, and today I am joined by Edward Hong, founder of the PGM, PGM VO List, VOC co-founder Jasmine Green, otherwise known as Jazzy Fizzle, and voiceover actor Marcus Rothenberg. I um, want to have them introduce themselves because who can vouch for them better than themselves. So we're going to start with our fearless leader of the PGM VO list, Edward. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Edward Hong. Uh, as Ninja said, I am the founder of the PGM VO list. First off, thank you for everyone who is taking their Sunday time, especially on a Father's Day and especially on Juneteenth, to spend your two hours with us talking about authentic and responsible casting and voiceover, which for some people is not that fun of a topic but it must be discussed, especially as we try to move the needle forward in representation. I am very grateful for everyone here and especially our amazing panelists and to Tanisha, who is our gracious moderator and one of the panelists as well. So thank you all for being part of this. Thank you, Edward Jazzy Frizzle. Hello. What it do? What it do? Hi, everybody. I am Jazzy Frizzle. I am co-founder of Voices of Color. So shout out to Jaden Harp of, as the other co-founder. Um, yes, as Ed said, thank you so much for being here with us. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Father's Day all around. Um, and yeah, this is a very important conversation uh, that needs to be had. And I'm very grateful that we're, we're having it. Awesome. Thank you. And last but certainly not least striking in turquoise, Marcus Rothenberg. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Marcus. I'm a uh, non-binary biracial voice actor based out of central Illinois. Been doing this for a few years. Happy to be here. Happy to be talking with you. And I'm happy to get started. Well, that is exactly what we're about to do. Oh, wait, 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 before we continue. And then, of course, we have Tanisha Graham, um, who needs to introduce herself as well. I guess so. I was going to try. See, I tried to get that pass, sir. And you, you see, they don't give me a pass. Um, my name is Tanisha Nicole, and I am a voiceover actor. I'm also one of the admins on the PGMVO list group. There's an amazing group of us that do all the work in the background. Um, so yeah, that is me. I'm excited to be here, excited to moderate this panel. And so let's get some truths out here and start calling a spade a spade. Okay. Um, so the reason for this, although the entertainment industry continues to move forward with more authentic casting and representation and voiceover work, we've all seen this here in recent memory, right? But there's still so much more that needs to be done before there is parity and equity is reached. During the first hour of our panel, we will have what is sure to be a very lively discussion around the impact of authentic casting and what organizations, um, including casting directors, uh, production houses, movie, movie houses, all these can do to support working PGM voice actors. And PGM means people of the global majority, okay? As we roll into our second hour, trust me, it's gonna go by really quickly. Uh, we will roll into a live Q&A. So please utilize the Q&A chat box to ask your questions. And then when the time comes, um, you can raise your hand and then we will unmute you and allow you to speak, but we will meet you after you ask your question. And so that you can ask your question to the panel. Housekeeping note, and this is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say before we get started with our questions. We know and understand that things can get heated and escalate very quickly, that there are varying opinions on this particular topic. Respectful discourse is acceptable and expected, full stop. However, there's a caveat to that. Please keep all comments and questions professional, respectful, and tactful. Abusive, bullying, derogatory, or inflammatory language is strictly prohibited. The moderators here and the admins reserve the right to remove any attendee who does not adhere to this request and block them from joining in the future. Okay, just so that we're all on the same page in the same paragraph, preferably on the same sentence line. Okay, um, my block button is strong. Ask anybody on Twitter, they know. I have no problem with giving you a very polite boot and let you go about the rest of your Sunday. All righty, are we ready to start? Everybody ready? Okay, so we talk about diversity and casting and, uh, casting and authentic casting. I think the first thing we need to do is define what is diversity for each of you? You know, what does diversity mean to each of you? And then 
how is it currently perceived versus how it should be perceived? So let's start with Edward. Um, you're first on my, on my screen here. Uh, for me, what diversity means is just uh, going beyond the status quo, going beyond what is considered mainstream or just like the homogenous definition of what things are supposed to be as opposed to having different voices, opinions, ethnicities, religions, just like having everything so that you understand different points of view, even if you don't understand yourself or a culture, you don't understand it. And to me, that is what diversity is. And for me to add on to the true diversity is when it's not forced upon by a corporation, when it's not performative because it's the hot thing to do. It's, it's the long road where all of us can get to a point where it just becomes a norm. Like when we think of someone, we aren't just thinking of like one set of ethnicity or gender or race or that kind of thing. It just becomes, you can think of everyone, but understandably we are humans and we are tend to bias and prejudice. So that's a long road for all of us. So I think diversity is just the openness to having all perspectives and people uh, in your life and everywhere around you. Absolutely, that part. Jazzy, anything to add to that? Um, I, I think I think Ed pretty much nailed it. Um, it, it, it. Honestly, in an ideal world, diversity shouldn't even be a word because it's just regular human interaction and it's it's there, you know? There's all different cultures, all different ethnicities, all different, you know, LGBTQIA is just, it doesn't, you know, it shouldn't matter. So in an ideal world, diversity wouldn't even like be a problem <laughs> if that makes sense. So that's what I would add to it. Awesome, and Marcus, of course. I just gotta piggyback off what they said. I agree with everything. Diversity, basically a broad spectrum of people not just like ed said this homogenized thing that we see not friends not the show friends basically whenever we get a show or a movie or a book that has a wide range of people instead of just here's all these white people doing stuff and as far as like how it's perceived now and the forced diversity that's when we get like the the black best friend trope like we have all these white people, but it's okay because their black or their best friend is black. So hey, we're diverse now, and that's that's not it. That part. When I tell you, I cannot stand that. I cannot stand that. And you know, I I call out, and I, I respect South Park so much because no one is safe from South Park, right? And they have the one black character that is Token Blackman, and it is just a fitting name, right? Um, when you have that tokenism and people think, oh, well, now I've added someone that makes it diverse. No, tokenism is not okay either. That is another issue. Um, so I'm totally with you all on that. Thank you for that. So as we kind of go into that, um, there is this thing that we've all seen on Twitter. We've seen it all over social media when people doing announcements and so forth. Can global majority actors play other ethnicities? Or now here's the thing, it's not can, should, because there's a difference between can and should. Jazzy. Oh, you gotta ask me first. Um, no, no, I don't, I don't think um, PGM should play other PGM um, because that's, authentic's the word, right? Authentic is the word. So I'm not going to audition for Asian roles. Or I'm not going to audition for Latin roles. You know what I mean? Latin roles, because I just, I'm not, I don't fit into that, that category and I can't offer that authenticity to a role. So no, I, I honestly don't think so. Edward? I, yeah, I'm going to, I was thinking about it. It was like, well, there is this, the answer is mainly going to be no. Uh, I know it can be a little bit more complex, especially within the Asian diaspora, where it's just, mm -hmm. God knows how many Asian identities they are. And so there's always a discussion of like, okay, you got East Asians, Southeast Asians, and South Asians, and Southwest Asians, and who can play who? And so uh, I think in the Asian, I think in our respective Asian category, there is some kind of understanding that's like, okay, you know, East Asians can play each other. If it's like a generic American role, of some East Asian descent, yeah, sure. But then if it's like, it gets to uh, what I always call like, like who who has more privilege? 
who has more power and kind of keep that in mind. So I would say in the Asians, East Asians are at the top and then Southeast Asians and South Asians are lower. So for nowadays in Hollywood, East Asians tend to play every Asian category. They'll play Southeast Asians. They won't play South Asians because Hollywood is not that dumb where they can get away with that. But I see so many times with like Koreans and Chinese playing Vietnamese, Laotian, uh, Hmong people. And that to me is not acceptable because they are, are on the lower scale of privilege. And so I think uh, our, in the end, I think it's just like we try to be as authentic as possible and only then try to hit what I call the ballpark. Like hit, so if it's like you're looking for black actors or if it's like, let's say a West African role, like, you know, if you can't find a West African actor, you hit the ballpark, which is the black community. You're not going to be like, all right, screw it. We're just going to find a white actor now. Like you try to hit the ballpark at the worst case scenario. And that's what I feel like, you know, when when can PGM actors play other ethnicities or be cast or you write roles for that? Hit the ballpark. At the very least, do that. And, you know, there might be some criticism. They're like, well, why didn't you find a Korean or a Nigerian actor or whatever the project is? And, but I think at the very least to hit that so that at least there is some represented representation in that correct scale to that degree awesome marcus anything to add um i agree wholeheartedly uh it's like ed said finding that ballpark but also like jazzy said of uh, like i'm i'm not going to audition for a character that is described in the casting call as like a southeast asian male that's that's not me i can't represent that i can't authentically voice that character um, but if there's any kind of, and even for me being biracial, I will go a step farther and ask a casting director sometimes, because a lot of times I'll see in a casting call, this character is biracial. That means a lot of things. They're, biracial doesn't just mean black and white. Right. Someone can be biracial. They can be, I have a black mom and a Korean dad. They're biracial. But things like that. It's not just... I, it, there seems to always be this pigeonhole of this character's biracial or this character's mixed. Everyone should know what that means. And it's different. So if I see a casting call that says this character's mixed or this character's biracial, I'll ask the CD, hey, exactly how is this character mixed? Because there are certain mixed characters that I can play and that I can authentically voice and portray. There's others that I can't. And right. so I don't want to be stepping into someone else's lane when that's a role that's not meant for me right that's really important i want to stay there for a quick second when you talk about when they say the, you know the, the character is biracial or they're mixed and it goes back to what the default is mm -hmm. because the default is white and so it's automatically assumed because the default is white that it's going to be black and white when there are so many other ethnicities and races that are mixed and to people that are mixed of mixed heritage and they don't consider that and again that's also something that we have to work on with them with their thinking is that stop making the default everything to be white like the nude this place oh the color nude well the default color nude is a peach color i'm sorry you can look at me i am deeply melanated a nice hershey chocolate brown nude for me is not going to be defaulted to be something that's peach or pink and so having to get people out of that box that they're in and those labels that they're in, right? So thank you for bringing that up. That, is, that was very, very important. And it's something that I definitely um, think that we don't touch on enough because we talk about authentic casting. We're talking about you know Asian and Black, but when we talk about mixed, that's not something that we normally touch on. And it's something that is very important because we don't want to exclude any of our brethren and our sister and any person um, of mixed heritage um, because it's it's already tough enough within society where they don't quite always feel like they belong right and then we have to deal with this within the voiceover the acting community as well thank you so much for that um so as we talk about can that talk and can yeah I talk real quick on that, I, I wanted to, to bring up uh, with the biracial like uh, aspect of it, like we understand that, you know, someone being mixed may be, it may be fine to hard, it may, words are hard, y'all. It may be hard to find a specific voice actor that is specifically mixed of those things, right? So 
the authentic part of it is you're one of them. Like, it's fine. Like, okay, well, I, I only meet half of this. Like, I, I'm full Southeast Asian and I'm not Black at all. You meet your authentic still for the role. Um, we understand that it's not the combinations aren't, you know, always going to happen in voiceover, but you can try and you can at least meet most of that criteria, like, like Ed was mentioning. Um, so uh, I did want to also bring up like the prime example of we, like that we can all think of with PGM playing other PGM is uh, Phil Lamar doing Samurai Jack. And as a perspective, from a perspective point, it's like, mm, you shouldn't have done that, but at least they're not white. That says a lot about the situation. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the questions actually um, that's on that's on my mind and that we were talking about before. Let's let's go ahead and do it. Let's go ahead and we're gonna we're gonna get nitty gritty. Let's talk about anime. Let's talk about when they say, oh, it shouldn't matter what the color of the voice actor's skin is as long as the voice fits. But the minute, the second that a black lead is cast in an anime there are racist and bigoted backlash and no black folks shouldn't be doing this. And we're sitting there going, but wait a minute, didn't you just say? Oh, so it's okay as long as there's any voice, as long as it's not a black voice and it's not a black face and it's not a black body. So let's talk about the hypocritical double standard. Who wants to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. On. Um, oh man, this might land me in some hot waters. Okay, here we go. Um, the anime, okay, I'll start with the positives. The anime community is very expressive, very passionate, very vocal in terms of what they want and what they don't want. But one of the problems of the anime fan community is extremely how toxic they are. And I think it, this is also where it's like, it's not just, I'm not just talk, talking about white anime fan actors. I think it also applies to global majority uh, actor uh, fans as well. Because I think more often than not, every one of us have some sort of like, we have some sort of like, white privilege in us where it's like you know we took take it for granted or we think that this is the standard of beauty or we think this is how it should be or how they should look or how should how they should talk and sometimes like i catch myself like you know when i think of a neutral accent i sometimes have to realize that i i realize i'm hitting the point where i think it's a standard american accent but what is truly a neutral accent in this world that we live in and especially if we're talking about the global majority it's not an american accent that is not the neutral universal accent. So universal has always been like catered towards white, has always, you know, in terms of voice and looks and sound. And a lot of times we believe in it. We think, you know, when we think someone's ugly and we have to step back, we're like, wait, am I thinking they're beautiful or ugly in the white standards or like how they are truly? And the same thing goes for voice. And I think that's where it's like, I see anime fans and they have their own like little mindset of just like, what is considered the right voice for anime? And I think that if I have to be really technical, well, anime was created in Japan and it was created by Japanese people. So if we're going to get really technical, it's not white at all. So the notion that now anime fans think that this is a white thing is completely off. So it's like, if you want to go for like, it's kind of like, you know, who are the true Americans? Everyone think like, oh yeah, America like this. It's like, no, that's the indigenous people. They are truly the real Americans. They're like the OG Americans. And we always forget that in conversation. So same thing with anime. You have to think of the mindset that the original was Japanese, made with Japanese people in mind. So it's like any discussion you have that this is not the right voice, especially when you have black uh, actors voicing the leads needs to be thrown out. Just, be, just you have to go, look, did they do a good job? Does it fit the character? And that's it. Regardless of whatever that is, then, you know, that's the important discussion that we need to have when it comes to anime and Black leads. Marcus, Jazzy? I'll follow up. Because, yeah, I. if you know me on Twitter, you know I have opinions. And you know I'm very outspoken about them. And I don't care about people getting pissed off at me for what I have to say. Goku is not white. All right. So the fact that everyone wants a white voice actor for all of these characters, none of them are white, y'all. Uh, most of your favorite anime characters are not white. 
maybe like Alexander Louise Armstrong from FMA or Edward Elric. They're white, sure. Piccolo's not, he's an alien. Goku's not, he's an alien. Or if you talk about any anime that takes place in Japan, you think it's mostly white people living in Tokyo? No. So why does it have to be mostly white people voicing these characters? And then in inevitably on Twitter, whenever, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a heater right now. Inevitably on Twitter, whenever we see someone be cast as a character, like we saw this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we see this a lot with Zeno all the time. And he's a fantastic voice actor. Why are y'all giving him guff for landing a role? He's very good. And you know what? He's voicing a character. Oh, but he's not white. He doesn't look like the character. That character is not white. 99 times out of 100. But he's a great voice actor. And he's nailing this role. And then constantly you'll have the backlash of like, well, I'm not racist. It's just you know what? If you're not racist, you don't have to try and convince people that you're not racist. So if you I have a problem... I didn't racist. It's still racist. Yeah. If you have a problem with a black voice and a dub, then stick to subs. But surprise, those voices aren't white either. So that's, that's me. No, I'm here for it. I'm here for all of it. I'm all here for that too, because it's facts. It's just what it is. It's It's that's what it is. And yeah. I, I can't express to you the frustration I feel when I see a, a black voice actor like yeah, in this anime, in this latest anime and the backlash. And it's not even it's again, it's the toxic community because it's the same for black cosplayers. It doesn't make sense. Y'all are so mad that they can't authentically por portray these people, but neither do the white voice actors, neither do the white cosplayers. If you're going to attack black voice actors and cosplayers have that same energy with the white ones. Okay. It's not, it's not the same. Your racism is showing watch out. Okay. Or even just get rid of that energy Don't, or just get rid of it. Why are you so what's up with this vitriol that you have against these people that are cosplaying or voicing or something like that? I don't understand the hatred. So when I tell y'all, I don't understand racism. I genuinely don't get it. Like, I don't understand what you're upset about. All the biases in the world, I say that the solution for it is mind your business. You literally okay. need to mind your business and you'll be fine. Drink water and mind your business. Thank you. <laughs> I refuse to spend my entire black life explaining white supremacy to, white supremacy to itself. I just, I, I, don't, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy for it. Um, I, I love this and I love where we're going because we finna get a little nitty gritty, go a little bit, let's go a little bit deeper. Go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. At what point does caring about finding the right voice turn into, oh, well, they're just no talented minorities? Oh, we couldn't, find, we couldn't find anybody. Oh, there is a, for instance, Edward, you, um, you help out, you know, you have um, book publishers that are have access to the PGMBO list, right? Um, and there was this one, I believe it was, uh, forgive me if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm doing this incorrectly, it was a Chinese author or some of Chinese descent, and they were getting the audio book done, and they were not included in the process, and they ended up having cast a Japanese person, a person of Japanese descent, and the pronunciations, because Chinese Mandarin is very tonal, and so you can say something with the wrong tone, and you, ooh, you're going to be in trouble, because you didn't say something else, and you said something about somebody's mama. Um, and the author was horrified because it was so wrong. And like the, act, the voice actor is great, but you can tell that this person does not speak Mandarin. And so now you have this product that is out in the open for everybody to see that is not authentically cast. And it's doing damage both to the author and you know, to the publishing company. So then it goes into, okay, are you saying that you couldn't find not one Mandarin speaking audio book narrator in the entirety of the world? Not one, not one. Edward, please, please come in because you was all over Twitter. All oh yeah, I can explain a little more that actually once I found the real truth of it, it was actually more infuriating than I originally envisioned. Uh, so the whole issue was that, uh, so they cast someone, they, they didn't audition this person. They're like, oh, we know this uh, narrator and she's a great narrator. And so they're like, okay, she's going to do it. 
but I guess they didn't, they failed to inform her just like how much Mandarin words there's, they were going to be in there. And she didn't, didn't know how to do it. And so uh, when this whole thing came out and then when I reached out to her, then, you know, I reached out to her literary agent and then it got me in contact with the president of the publishing audiobook company. And uh, they're one of the companies who use the database. <laughs> So they, when the president responded and he said that uh, we're going to now dive into your resource. And I would kind of just like stared at the email and be like, so you never did. You never looked at it. And this might be a conversation. I don't know if it, actually this is the perfect place to have a conversation, which is about companies and casting directors who ask access, whether it be PGMVO list or any other resource on diversity, whether crew or actors or directors, whoever, and whether they actually use it, whether they actually care to use it. And so I realized they didn't actually care until their asses were handed to them because the author went so out there on public and being like, this is fucked up. And so, um, that's a whole, that's a whole nother issue where it's just a company who's, who just don't care and only realize they have to because they're being called out on it. Uh, in terms of just like, I'm sorry, I'm getting so you. What was your original question? <laughs> so it was it was talking about um, when no, finding the right voice turns into the right voice, sound yes. minority, yes. Uh, I don't believe that there is such a thing as like, you know, it was impossible to find. There are so many cases where I see white actors that they were like, you know, we did exhaustive search and we found a great one, but he has no training or he or she is no training. They just came out of like Australia or somewhere. They're like, we found that we found that person. And I'm like, so you went, you did a worldwide search and you found the best white actor possible for your biopic about, I don't know, Elvis Presley, which is, yes, yeah, coming up. So it's kind of like that kind of thing. So it's like, it is the same kind of dil diligence and care can be done for global majority actors and characters as well. And yes, understandably, casting tells me that, you know, sometimes they have no time, which is true. And I, that's another conversation where casting does, is not given enough money or time to do the job required well. I think more often than not, they're, they're, they're asked to do miracles within like a 24 hour notice. And that is completely unfair for them. So even with the ones who are doing their best, I, I do understand their plight. But I think this is this goes to corporate, the higher up level, which is that like, you know, you have to put care and attention to this uh, to find the right voice because you can. And sometimes if, let's say, you know, I've hear all the time community theater, like in some like very white town somewhere in the South, they're doing like some. They're gonna, they're like, we want to do a diverse play. So they did like a black play and they cast everyone being a white actor because no, they couldn't, they didn't have any black students there. I go, then just don't do the play. Just don't do it because you don't have the actors for it. It's honorable what you're doing. I, you know, it's great that you want to try to do some diverse black play, but if you don't have the actors to do it, then that's something you might have to look into. Why do we not have enough black students? What's going on with it? It's more of a systemic thing rather than like, let's try to cast some actors into it. You got to look yeah. at the root of the issue as opposed to like, you know, actors and, you know, blame the actors, blame right. this. It's, I mean, it goes all the way to the top. I mean, I'm not going to sit and watch an all-white production of A Raisin in the Sun. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that right now. Not going to happen. If you're going to do Roots on Broadway and it's an all-white cast. No. Don't, we're not, don't we're, give me nightmares tonight. We're not doing that. But I want to... Because I want to pose this to, to Marcus and Jazzy. I want to, to, to really just kind of focus on something that you said, um, Ed, Edward. Is I want to go back to the part about the voice actor knowing that they cannot do something authentically. To my fellow panelists, when does it become the voice actor's responsibility to step back from a role or a project in I these cases? As soon as it's not right, as soon as it's not right. There are multiple, so the, the checks and balances of a project are put in place for a reason and they're not being used. So you start with the original creation of the project. Um, the writer or the creator, the artist can consult somebody who is of that ethnicity and make it accurate. If that doesn't happen, okay, what's next in the process? We're doing casting, right? Casting director doesn't put on the, you know, the, the casting call, we are looking for this specific ethnicity or they do it incorrectly or, you know, okay, missed the opportunity there. Now we're going to the voice actors 
who, okay, the, the casting call doesn't specifically say an ethnicity or, you know, doesn't check these boxes. So everyone auditions, right? Or there's no character design. So they audition, totally fine, happens, all right? Now we are at the point where now we see what this character looks like. Now we see the script, we see the context, we, we see everything. If all those checks and balances didn't work out, we now have the proper information to fix it. So if a character comes out after you've been cast for it and it's completely left from what you can authentically portray, you step away. The voice acting community cares too much about clout across the board. It's, it's a problem. And we're gonna bring it up because we're here. There was a recent casting for a, I believe it was an indie game where the character was being portrayed as a black woman and it was cast by a white woman. And it was a very dark skinned black woman too. Very dark skin. And the, there were so many reasons that the dev gave as to why it wasn't a black woman, but then it's that it, you could have changed the character. You can fix it, you can change the character. The voice actor stated that uh, there was no character design before, uh, like when she got cast for the project and which is fine but once that design came out you should have walked away she said that she told the dev to, to change it because it was not right dev said no but she still kept the roles she said she asked her pgm friends and vas if it was okay and they said yes where in the checks and balances are y'all telling y'all friends that this is okay she phoned it but here's the thing she said she talked to her poc friends did she talk to a black person was the question because black and people person of color are not or synonymous. Two, are not the same thing so there exactly. are checks and balances that should be put in place that nobody's utilizing one your real friends will not let you show your ass like that okay yeah. they will tell you you need to step away yeah. You need to step away. Any true friend, y'all, seriously, any true friend of y'all's will tell you no, no or when exactly. you're doing something wrong, exactly. okay? Accountability is so important in this industry and especially for the fight for authenticity and diversity. I am very disappointed in this community as of this day because oh, no, I completely get it. for people to, to, to applaud this and then not to mention the backlash that voice actors got for calling it out and how it was wrong from other PGM. Oh, that I got a whole bunch of not trolls. okay. Because I was the person that went out and said, hey, and actually started the conversation on Twitter with the game dev who turned around and actually, and this is what's even worse is that the game dev is a young black man. And I asked him, I said, where did I said, you know, he's oh, well, here's, I would love to say, you know, tell you what my thoughts are, why you did. I said, I would love to hear. I'm very interested to hear as to how you thought that this was okay. And he went on this kind of spiel where, oh, I had the voice in my head beforehand. I'm like, okay. And he said, I, I, you know, the color of the skin didn't come into play. I said, mm -mm, you don't get a pass on that. I am a fellow black person and I'm going to hold you accountable because that is love. That is what we do um, within our community. We hold each other accountable. And I was like, no, you don't get a pass on that. I said, choosing a skin color, even down to the tone of the skin color is a very methodical and very precise decision. And I said, and even then, when you were choosing that, when you were choosing the skin color, forgot, oh, well, she was a god, and so gods can be any color. I said, the Orisha and the Oshun are black. I said, if you were supposed to be guy, you could have made her green. You could have made her purple. I don't care. But where I said, did you not catch the cognitive dissonance when you did this? And then here come the haters and the trolls. And then, they, you know, I got called everything but a child of God, which <laughs> I take that as a badge of confidence. Thank okay. you. Thank but you look, for that. And, yeah. and that, that, whole, that whole issue, it brought up so many other internal issues. Y'all yeah. need to stop. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're black, purple, green. Or, no, 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 no. Black is a aliens. real, real thing. Being black is real. Being purple, being yeah. green is not. Do yeah. not. Do not uh, like exclude our existence by comparing us to things that aren't real. Yeah. That is not okay. No, so no. I'm very disappointed. And again, another reason why I'm very happy that this discussion is happening because PGM as well need to do better. Yeah, we have to eventually we, talk about the, we have to talk about the anti-blackness that happens within, within PGM and the colorism that happens within PGM across the board. That is definitely something and unfortunately, you know, we ain't got enough time in a day to day to do that, but that is definitely a conversation. I think that is our next step in this is that we start digging into our own communities and start addressing 
the internalized racism that is within our own communities that is feeding into our casting decisions, that is feeding into our acceptance of certain roles when we know, you know the ancestors that are talking to you, telling you, mm -mm, mm -mm, and you're not listening. But then you're also not listening to the other folks within your community who are trying to help you to keep you from showing your whole ass on social media and getting dragged for filth. Because to be honest, this community, as large as it is, is also very small and it is very cliquish. And you make one wrong misstep. We have seen it where people have been completely disavowed off of projects because of things that they said and things that they've done and their decisions. And all I want you to do is like drink water, mind your business and make good decisions, right? So then how do you reconcile individuals caring more about white tears and white victimhood as opposed to the fact that the white individual has been cast for a black or a global majority role? Marcus. Sorry, real quick. Before, yeah, before come on. I touch on that, something on the other thing like, oh, well, I asked other POC about this. You don't just get a pass from your totally existent black friend. Thank like, you. He's that's not, not, not phone of a black friend. That happens. Okay. Yeah you don't get to say like, oh, well, I can do this because my black friend over here said I could. That's not a fucking thing. Shut up. And when people call you out on this stuff, I'm not going to say all of the time. I'm going to say a lot of the time. People are doing it from a place of accountability, not a place of hatred or anger. Well, maybe, maybe anger, but not like hatred. So I call people out on stuff a lot kind of my brand, but I also invite people to call me out. If I'm ever being, if I'm ever on some bunk stuff, tell me, tell me, if you come to me with, from a place of love and authenticity, I am not going to get mad about it because sometimes mm -hmm. I show my ass too. I need you to tell me to pull my pants up. Like if I'm showing my ass, just tell me, I'm going to do the same for you. So if someone's coming at you and saying, Hey man, that's, that's not the move reflect for a minute before you just get mad just take yeah. the time to say why is this person coming at me telling me this is it because i'm messing up just take that moment to reflect yeah. it's about sitting it's about sitting in it and it, mm -hmm. and i think people are so they get so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable it's only in the uncomfortable places that we learn and that we grow if you have dug yourself into a hole sit down sit in said hole, look around you and take some perspective and figure out how you got to where you are. And then when you finally have that epiphany, you realize it and you ask for help. Not asking people to do the homework for you because Google is free. Google is free. I don't have to explain the, the oppressed do not have to explain to the oppressor why they are oppressed, but ask for help. Go and do some learning. And then eventually you will see a hand come up from above that is going to reach out to you and it's going to pull you out of the hole that you've been in because like okay you've been here long enough i think you finally got it and that's what we're missing and then as far as the question of how do you reconcile individuals caring more about white tears white victimhood as opposed to the fact that the white individual has been casted for a uh black or pgm role you touched on me first and i'll be honest I'm not the person to ask that question because I cannot care about white tears. Fair enough. I can't. I am incapable. I live in the U.S., so that means I live in a country that is on land stolen from Native Americans, built on the backs of slaves and uh, immigrants later on, that has a constitution and a government that was made by white people for white people. So whenever this country was founded, None of that applied to me. If I lived back then, none of that applied to me. So why should I care that you're upset that other people are getting opportunities right now? Because that's all it is. You're looking through the lens of white supremacy and you're mad that white supremacy is, I'm not going to say going away. We got a long way to go, but fizzling out. So why is it that I should care that you're not being lifted up on this pedestal anymore. If anything, I'm very glad that you're getting knocked off of that pedestal. I personally love it that my people are succeeding and that my people are winning and that my people are getting opportunities and you cannot make me feel guilty about that. So white tears, please let me grab my cup. I want to drink them up. That's You better come through. <laughs> you better come through. 
Edward? Because I, I, Edward, I can see you over there. You like, you, I know you want to say something. I know you want to say something. Come on. Oh man. Uh, for me, I think to be, if I have to come to terms and be honest with myself, there has been more times than I would like to count where I catered to, like I was very sympathetic to white tears, probably because I didn't want to rock the boat, probably because like I didn't want to be that angry of a person. And I think there are times where I let I let them off too easily. Like I remember there was a time where there was a casting director who, you know, she was casting the show for a long time. And then, you know, they're, they're bringing the show back and the studio was like, hey, we want to have, give more chances to global majority casting directors. And, uh, and so granted this person did the show for a long time, but then they were kind of upset. They're like, well, I should still get the chance. But then at the same time, they were telling me, they're like, oh, we are uh, very supportive of uh, diversity and giving people chances. And yet when your job was on the line, granted, you've done this show for years. So it's like you had the privilege of working on it for a long, long time. That when the opportunity was given to another person, that you resisted to that. And so I think I realized that I didn't say much to that. I, you know, I was just like, oh, okay. And then it, it kind of got into a tricky landmine because she, she, they were saying that their diversity card was like, well, I am also LGBTQ. And then the studio kind of like t t stood back and was like, okay, all right, you should have the job then. You are considered diverse. There are, th there are some conversations and arguments where it's just like, is this the day you want to like burn down the farm and that kind of thing? And I was like, maybe not today. Because, you know, it's like, I do care about the LGBTQ community and they are very much a voice that needs to be acknowledged and heard. But it's hard when someone uses, someone is white and uses that other card to show why they should have the job. There was no answer to that, but it's still, it made me feel uneasy to this day. And there are many cases where it's just like little things that our white colleagues or white affirming colleagues will say. and. I think there are times where it's like, oh, should I have said something? Because I just kind of like laughed it off. And then there are, yes, there are times where it's like, it's so egregious, you have to say something. And then I realized that, you know, you burned a bridge. And I, some of the things I remember was just like, I would say like, for example, I support Palestinian rights. I think there are very much people that needs acknowledgement. That's not saying that, you know, I'm not disacknowledging the Jewish people or what's going on or the hatred that's done or the anti-Semitism. But I remember with some studio colleagues, just some uh, industry colleagues, they burned, and they, they were like, you need to apologize for what you said about Palestinians because there are not people worth acknowledging. And I said, I can't, I can't meet where you are. I have to go with my beliefs. And I think there are some times in your career, and I think 2020, where it was definitely evident for many of us where it's like, where do you draw the line of like your integrity and your career? And I think more often than I've burned so many paths in my career because I stood my integrity that I was like, I don't think I want to work with you. Like, I know I already burned my bridges with block M casting, which we will talk about soon. Yes. I've auditioned for that office many times over the years. After this, that person's, <laughs> that's not going to happen anymore. But who cares? Fuck you, Michael Beaudry. Uh, so there it is. So I think it's just like, that. if you lose, if you feel yourself like you're, you know, you didn't speak up and you feel bad about it, it, it happens. It happens. We it can't happens. always be warriors all the time, but no. I think we can always acknowledge it and remember, be like, how can I do better next time? That part right there, that part right there. And you made me come out my glasses. When I come out my glasses, you made me come out my glasses. Um, the part about burning bridges. It's okay to burn a bridge. I will, I will stand in the middle of the bridge and I set on fire because I want people to know my level of the fact that I do not care on either side. I will stand in the middle of it with a can of matches and some s'mores because you know I like chocolate and I do love my snacks. I will do that. I don't care if that is what has to be done because it's one thing what you do thinking in front of people. Integrity is what happens behind the scenes when no one is watching. Do you keep that same energy? And, and Ed, well, you do. Uh, you absolutely do. And you will stand 10 toes down for it. All of you here do that. And I am so grateful for that because that gives me personally a bit more say, you know what? If they can do it, I can do it. I know that I'm not alone in this stand. Jazzy, you are like you biting on a bit over there. I see your, your, your background changed again. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it
it's it's hard. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely a conversation because I, myself, I classify myself as a, a, a people pleaser. Um, and that stems from me as a black woman. Uh, I, I always have this self question of, am I overly nice because I don't want to be perceived as the bitter, angry black woman, or mm -hmm. am I actually nice? Um, it's it's a problem and so when you when you have that and you're in a moment where it's you versus right my tears uh you step back because you're like okay i don't want to you don't want to be upset. labeled and i don't and i don't want to get angry and then mm -hmm. be perceived as the angry black woman yeah but but you have every right to be angry though that's and, the problem and, and that's it that's the thing is it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? right? So all these things we go through that make us angry, but they don't realize it because we're holding it back because we don't want to be angry. We don't mm -hmm. want to be perceived as that, but there's no other option. There isn't so because if we can't fix it. We can't, we, you can't fix problems that you don't know exist. And some people live in this whole willful ignorance piece. Oh, I didn't know, mm, mm -hmm. but you kind of did. Well, you didn't actually say anything. So do I have to say something for you to know that something is not right? <laughs> that part so the burden shouldn't always be on us to educate you it and is not our it is not our responsibility to educate you exactly and if and in those moments where like exactly like ed said like uh, well do better next time yes perfect you can't we can't always expect you to hold the emotional labor to put that on yourself you don't have to be the arbiter or the beacon of justice it's, you're just a person and sometimes it gets tiring and it, you can't you can't put that stress on yourself man it's not don't beat yourself up if you called them out good dope awesome if you didn't if you took a step back you might not have had the energy for it and i can't be mad at you for that i can't expect you to hold my space and defend me or defend others every moment of the day sometimes you need to rest too and i get that so don't beat yourself up yeah, um, I want to acknowledge that advocacy is a privilege. We understand not everybody can do it. Not not everybody can put themselves out there and are able to yeah. be like, well, I lost a job because I believe in equal rights for all. Okay, you know, and we'll, we'll be fine. You know, like yeah. if I lost, if someone said, well, we can't hire you because you think Taiwan is a country. Oh, the F well, like, okay, fine. It's I'm, I'll just move on to the next one. Right. Like I, if you, if I got fired for that, I wouldn't want to work with you anyway. So we understand it is a privilege to be able to speak out and, and it's yeah. totally fine. The issue is it's, it's not you staying silent. If something is wrong on Twitter and you don't comment, that's okay. Not, you can't speak on everything. Don't carry too much. I always say self-care is the best care. Please don't carry too much. Don't don't carry burdens that don't belong to you. Exactly. But also don't support it. That part. So if it's um, if, if it's not an authentic casting, do not comment congratulations or awesome. You're perfect or like for it. it. Don't, don't don't like it. Don't yeah. support it. Because now, especially if you're part of this uh, these underserved communities that you know, this character was miscast as, you're fighting against us who are fighting for you. And we're the ones with our necks on the line. Yeah. We are the ones who are publicly out here fighting. And if we have our own community fighting against us by showing support for what we're fighting against, what's the point? What's the point? That's you know, that, recently, yeah. you said something great, the don't support it thing. So like, if you see a Twitter casting or something, this happened just recently within our community, guys. Yeah, this was uh, last week. Yeah, uh, with, uh, oh my God, I'm blinking on the anime now. Moriarty. Uh, yeah. I did not say anything. I didn't offer congratulations, but I also didn't offer corrective action. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the energy that day. Like I had, I had just gotten over, well, still kind of recovering from COVID. Yeah. I, it came out on Twitter and it was something that I was like, man, I should really say something, but I am not in the headspace where I can articulate this well enough or say this in a way that's going to be positive yeah. and not just come off as me attacking or something like that. Cause I don't want to do that either. I'm, 
If yeah. I'm attacking you, it's because you did some genuinely vile shit. Vile shit, yeah. But if it's like you got a role that you shouldn't have gotten, I'm just not going to congratulate you. I might say something to you like, hey, that role should have gone to someone else. And yeah. I'm pretty sure it was you, Ed, that did that. And I remember seeing the comments and I thought, man, that's a little messed up. And I saw all these congratulations that I see. The next one was Ed that was like, this should have gone to someone that fit the bill. I'm like, Ed will burn it down. Yeah. Yes. Hell yeah. So, and a lot of the times, if we think the burden falls on us, like Jazzy said, don't carry too much. But at the same time, you got to think there's all, there's other people out there that will. It doesn't yeah. always fall on you. Take care of yourself. Be authentic to yourself. You see something bad, feel free to call it out. If you don't have the energy for it, nobody's going to fault you for right. just taking a step back and resting. It's okay to give yourself the kind of grace that you that you extend to other people. And I think that's something that we don't do within our, our PGM voiceover community is that we're so hard on ourselves, but we give other people who are non-PGM a lot of leeway and a lot of grace, but we don't give ourselves that when it's coming to our advocacy. And before we move into the, the, um, the live Q&A, there's this one question that I really, really want to touch on. And this goes back to what Ed was talking about um, when he was voicing his support for Palestine. Jazzy, you're talking about, um, you know, saying you know, Taiwan is a country. Um, so for production companies, casting companies, clients, we have seen, um, in just in very recent memory, a habit of terming talent for their beliefs and being open about their advocacy, right? Especially if that advocation has been for the equal rights of marginalized group, you know, PGM, our disabled community, when we're talking about, you know, taking away remote recording for anime uh, and telling everybody needs to come in studio. And we have our disabled community who is widely overlooked, um, who are being put at risk, but it's also their livelihood, these are their jobs. You know, I am disabled. People are like, oh, you don't look disabled. First of all, what does disabled look like? That's number one. And uh, also mind your business, mind your business. Um, and then we also talk about, you know, our LGBTQIA plus community, women and productive rights. So should it, it should only affect employment decisions if the opinions are, you know, harming said, you know, marginalized communities, right? But how do you feel that these companies, the production companies, the casting companies, you know, the clients themselves, how should they be addressing this? Jazzy, I can't with you. I can't with you. Who wants to go? Who, I'll it's, start. It's, a, it's a loaded I'll start question. Since I, since I went. Yeah, it's a loaded I went question. Meme. I went meme. Uh, it shouldn't happen. Now, if we look at the general consens consensus, again, words are hard, of America. All right, y'all have all these people that support all these terrible things. You have laws put in place to against women, against uh, LGBTQIA. Y'all have all these things and laws in place, but we get fired for saying that's not right. Make it make sense. The math is make not it mapping. make sense. The math is you're not gonna, mapping. yes, if you're gonna hire Joe Schmo down the street that was like, yes, for this law uh, against abortions, because I, whatever. But if I say, no, I'm in support, uh, I, I'm pro choice, oh, we can't hire you. What for? Why? For why? Why? Why okay. is it that? we can so easily accept people that are degrading or completely just like against whole entire communities of people and they just get slap on the wrist. But as soon as we're trying, we're defending people. As soon as we're, we're, it's, we're, it's us who's seen as the problem. Yeah. It's, we want diversity. Women should have the choice of this, this, and this. We want these good things for people, but we're seen as the problem for speaking out for that. It's all about the, it's about the, it's about the advertisement. It's it's money. Let's call it let's call a spade a spade. It's about the money. They don't want their advertisers to pull out. They don't want their VCs because a lot of people, you know, maybe that's on here don't necessarily realize there are venture capitalist firms that are funding some of these projects, especially on the larger scale. I mean, you know, companies make money, yeah, but how do you think they got their seed money? 
Most of them did not come up, you know, wealthy. They have venture capitalists. They have people that they're accountable to, and they don't want to rock that money boat, even though rocking said money boat is the right thing to do. And I want to touch on the fact that, especially on social media, whenever somebody is being attacked, uh, it's the people who are defending that are supposed to be professional and we're not supposed to lash back out. And that itself doesn't make sense. If I'm being attacked, if I'm being called slurs, I'm supposed to respond with, I'm sorry you feel that way, but, um, you know, it's just, the Can tone you see me as a person? The tone please? policing that, is, that, that they do for us. Yes. 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 Pretty, pretty, please. Can, can you just like be nice to me since I have to be nice to you? It doesn't make sense. If someone is coming for me, I need to be able to give that same energy because it's, I'm telling y'all, one day in this entire world, people are going to get tired of being the bigger person. People are going to get tired of being the bigger person. The, these whole communities that are being attacked, it's not going to end well. Because what is it? What's the expression? Uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. People are going to get tired of being the bigger person for the sake of looking good. These people attacking don't care about that. No they don't reason. care. So why should we? Marcus, Ed? I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm glad you said something about the straw that broke the camel's back. Because everyone always wants to focus on that moment, the, the moment where it happened, the straw that broke the camel's back, while ignoring the million other straws under it that led up to that moment. So yeah. if you're asking me, like, what should these companies do or how should these companies be, be handled, they need to address their prejudices or they need to fail. Simple as mm. that. Why do you have a problem with people advocating for these groups? Why? do you have take issue with someone fighting for equal rights it's because of your own prejudices and your own biases that you're not willing to give up so if there's a company that's our production agency or a client or whoever that is not in favor of equality and everyone being at the table they should fail they deserve to fail there should be no reason that we're propping up these harmful practices and these harmful companies that, it, I'm, I'm going to say it, they don't give a shit about you. So why are you trying to cape for them? That's the if question they're not right willing there. to address their prejudices. Now, if someone is willing to learn and educate themselves and be better, dope. Great. I have no problem with you. Mm -hmm. If you were shitty in the past and you're not now, I genuinely commend you. I, I'm happy for you. I have a ton of respect for you. That's awesome to see. But if you were shitty in the past, it was called out, and you continue to be shitty, I don't want to work with you. And frankly, I'm praying on your downfall, homie. So that part. And some people are like, oh, I don't, it's like, I don't wish you well. Now, I won't say, you know, that I want you, well, I will tell people, you can kick rocks with no socks down a gravel road. And I hope you skin your toe. I do. And I hope that you can bang your toe on the edge of something. And the day before that is due to heal, you hit it again. There it is. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, that pain, that pain, that nagging that is always there. I want you to feel that. I want you to feel all the, I want you to take all the disrespect that I can muster, you know, for your janky, janky behavior and your thoughts and how you're treating other people, period. That's what, yeah. I'm petty like I'm petty that the way. The one yeah. I always say to people is, I hope you have a day as pleasant as you are. Mm. That can be either an insult or it can be a nice thing. Like if I if I said that to Ed, Ed's a great dude. Yeah, Ed's gonna have a fantastic day. <laughs> Ed's about to have the best day ever. If I say that to you, you're gonna have a great day. Hey, it's Jazzy, gonna be a good hair. Day. I hope you have a day as pleasant as you are. You're a beacon of light. You're gonna have a dope day. But if you're terrible, I hope you blow a head gasket in your car on the freeway on the one-on-one. <laughs> yeah. -on -one. Like, yeah. Like, oh, that's going to cost you some money. Good. Feel that, all that disrespect. Thank you so much for that. Um, Ed, do you want to, to, to round us out before we head over yeah. to live Q&A? Uh, sure. Um, I think 
as you, when you ask that question and then everyone provided responses, the person that came to mind, it's the worst person they go like is, but it, it kind of fits into the question of just like how some people can get away with doing such shitty things. And for us, global majority, we get held to the flames for saying something that we believe in to be right. Yeah. And a person that made me think of, and I was just bringing was Ezra Miller and all the crazy shit he's been doing the past two years from like choking a woman that was recorded live on video to harassing and like terrorizing tourists in Hawaii. He lost so now minors. Being on the run from the cops because he kidnapped an indigenous teenager. And I'm looking at what is Warner Brothers saying? They're like, oh, we've been monitoring the situation. We're kind of worried about it. And I'm like, and it made me think of another very high profile entertainment incident. And I know there's many debates what he did was right or wrong, which was what Will Smith did to Chris Rock. Like, I know that's a hotly debated thing, but it's just, you look at those two, two and you see that the repercussions Will Smith faced was immediate, like right. immediate. And it's very swift and very like From deliberate. productions being on suspense, uh, suspended to being banned from the Academy to like, it was, it was like within like weeks. And with Ezra, it's been going on for like two, three years. And it's just, it just makes me think that like you, w- white people can get away with so much shit. Like they really can't. And even if they get quote unquote canceled, they're not really canceled. Like I look at who was like Gina Carano. She's doing great. You know, yeah. she has all, she has like studios that still back her up. So it's kind of like, you know, when people say, oh, white people got canceled, you know, blah, blah. I'm like, no, not really. No, you no. cannot Didn't compare. You know, like, Louis C.K. won a Grammy or something. They won a Grammy. So yeah. it's like, there's no cancellation for these, you know, especially for white people. It does not exist. I mean, like, let, yes, let a person of the global majority do that. Let it, let a global majority actor fan dangle his doodle in front of people forcibly and see what's going to happen to him. He won't win a Grammy. That's for absolutely yeah. certain. He's going to end up underneath the jail. I was going to say, he'd be in jail or dead. It might be a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. I got canceled. That's the title of my new Netflix special. How the fuck you got a Netflix special, man? <laughs> Come with it. Thank you. Y'all, this has been amazing. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. And again, yeah, this is going to hurt some feelings. It's going to ruffle some feathers, but feathers need to be ruffled. Feelings need to be hurt. You need to be upset. If you want to at me on Twitter, you know how to come find me. My profile is public. All of our profiles are public. We want to have these conversations with you. We want to have these conversations. So, you know, and hopefully this spurs conversations within conversations of the panelists that are on, the people that are watching on Facebook Live, that they'll start having these conversations and maybe start thinking a little bit going, oh, what have I done to uplift the PGM community? What have I done to hurt or harm the PGM community? How can I rectify that? How can I mitigate that? How can I continue to do advocacy while it's still at the same time protecting my own peace and my own income stream? Because, you know, people have to eat. Inflation is a thing. People, people need, you know, the basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Food, shelter, clothing, love comes way up the top, you know, self-fulfillment. You need food, you need food and shelter, right? And this is the work that people do. They go out and they, you know, they beat the block every day to do this, um, but never should your desire for money overshadow the fact that you really should you're taking castings that you should not be doing i'm just going to audition for it anyway okay um check your privilege check your privilege so now we're going to roll into our live q a there are questions that have been typed into the q a if you don't want to type them in but you actually want to say your question live with us we won't put you on camera but we will bring you up and let you um let you speak of course again before I do that, remember the housekeeping rule at the top of the hour that we talked about, y'all, okay? Not going to repeat it because we're all adults here, um, and I don't have to do that, but you know what it is, so make sure you keep it tactful, make it keep it respectful, okay? Um, so this is a, a little bit of a long one, so I'm going to read it out really quickly, okay? Um, yep, I like that, Jaden. Keep it cute, keep it mute, or get the boot. I need that on a t-shirt. Somebody get me a t-shirt ready. I need that because I'm going to put that on my next one. Um, when we do the next panel, if I moderate one, I'm going I'm to wear that shirt. Send that to me. Send that to me on, on Twitter so in my DM so that way I can get a shirt made. I will have a shirt made. Um, Carlette put in that since it is illegal for casting directors not to hire someone based on race, sexual 
sexuality, gender. So we're talking about title, um, title, uh, title seven and title nine. Um, whose responsibility is it to make sure that people who can authentically portray characters are being cast? Is it the agent sending out the auditions, the actors submitting their auditions, or should it be someone else? These laws are put in place, obviously, to prevent racism and discrimination. So how can we make sure there is authentic representation when refusing to hire someone based on a characteristic that is against the law? That's a hard one, because then that goes into a legal kind of thing. Um, versus, And there's a difference between very much so between what is legal and what is ethical. And what we're trying to touch on here today is what's ethical, not necessarily what is legal to do. Correct. Um, I was just going to say, because we got some laws in place that are not ethical in any sense. So, right. you know, yeah, what can we do? Right. Um, that's where the checks and balances comes back in. That, that, that's, that's where it, it has to, you have to be a responsible voice actor because if you clear, if you honestly, if y'all care that much about clout, when y'all announce that casting, that, that cast, when you make that cast announcement and people are going to hold you accountable for it. How are you going to feel about that? So start with yourself. It's like, well, if I, if I book this, if I book this, how's this going to look, right? Um, of course, it, it comes down to agents. What, who do they submit for that, that casting call? What, who did you send it out to? Did you send it to everybody on your roster who doesn't fit, you know, that, diversity box. I hate that, but diversity checkbox. Did you send it to everybody and you're submitting everybody? Or are you an agent that is like, okay, I see this. Okay. They're LGBTQIA. I have a list of my, my talents that I can send this to can double check. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's little things that everyone can do. Casting directors can put it in the specs that they, they, you did what you could, right? You, you, in the casting call you put needs to meet this criteria needs to do this right it's the responsibility of the voice actor to see that and be like oh i don't need those specs move on to the next one y'all there is so much work out there don't get hung up on one and don't ruin your career for one amen and hallelujah to that marcus ed do you want to touch on that or will you want to move to the next question i'll touch on like yeah i mean as you guys are saying that uh yeah there is, it's definitely tricky, especially for casting, like what they put on breakdowns legally, like, you know, they cannot specifically say we want this, although it's weird because as we often see, we see so many casting breakdowns, we'll just straight out say Caucasian, like we'll just say white. So it's just, it's hard because legally they're not supposed to do that. Like legally they're supposed to just say all ethnicities or preferably, you know, they'll say that in language, but I see too many like bigger projects where they'll just say white like Caucasian. And I'm like, all right, so you guys aren't really following the law, which goes to the whole like white privilege thing where it's like, you know, laws don't apply to you, but only to other people apparently. So when it comes, when I, I like to think that like, you know, if you want to be as, you know, you want to be as legal as possible, but still be passionate about what you're looking for. I've seen some great breakdowns from casting directors where let's say they're looking for a certain ethnicity and they're like, they'll say, we are very passionate about finding people of said heritage, descent, and lineage. We are very dedicated. They'll, 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 they'll like repeat it so that, you know, if you did not fit that and you submit for it and they look at it and be like, yeah, this person clearly did not read the instructions of what we're looking for. And so they'll even like say in the breakdown, like, you know, Vietnamese descent preferred. They'll say that kind of thing over and over and over and over yeah. again. And so agents, usually the smart ones, can pick up the cue and be like, okay, they're looking for, this is a pretty Vietnamese project or the very, you know, whatever ethnicity it is. And so I think that's important for casting to uh, do. And I think that is, you know, the standard that we need to do when it comes to these things. Uh, yeah, that, that is my thought on that. Same stuff. All I can really say is whenever it comes to legal issues like that, it's wording is wordplay mm -hmm. just word it correctly like exactly like ed said of like highly encouraged or strong passion like we're dedicated to you're not breaking the law in that scenario right but you're still getting your point across and i think that's important and then like jazzy said with the checks and balances but if all those checks and balances fail it does come on to you 
to then take that responsibility and step up to say, this isn't the role for me. Just like if I, if I was booked for a role and down the line, they're like, this is a heavy singing role. I can't sing. So I'm going to tell them I'm probably not the person for this. I can't sing. Right. I will do the exact same thing if, say, I'm booked for an indie game and I don't know that this goddess is supposed to be black. And then suddenly we get this character art and it's, hey, I'm not a black woman. This isn't the role for me. Yeah. Someone else will fit this better. It's about having the emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you hit that crossroads of what should I do to land roles and make money? And you, you have to have, you can't have, ask everyone to have the same morality, but it, you kind of are asking that question. Of, yes. And honestly, you're going to be looked upon way better by everyone if you just take that step back and say, hey, this ain't for me, as opposed to just going for it. No, absolutely. Thank you for that. Jazzy, you had something before we move oh, to our gosh, next question. It was there, and then my daughter came and like took it away from me. Um, oh, my gosh. It's all right. If you could, we'll come back to it. Say, pop a second to your mind. You know, it'll, raise, it'll, raise your oh, hand. Oh, uh, voice, yes. Voice acting is very much a referral uh, uh, business. Also, Stephanie made a great point. Uh, if, you're, if you're okay and comfortable with it, make it as public as you can. Um, yeah. You know, and it makes it easier for people to, to search you out or, you know, find you. Also, if you are cast for that and you don't fit, voice acting is very much referral based. You can be like, oh, this person isn't open about it, but I know that they are. So, hey, casting director, let me throw this, these couple of names your way. Um, they, I think they would be great fits. Don't be selfish, y'all. It, 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 it's as easy as recommendations and referrals it's it's nice and you know what somebody's going to do that for you someday too everybody remembers what side of the battle you're on everybody remembers what stance you took on a certain topic and on a certain stance and on a belief absolutely absolutely so then here's a question and i'm, I'm really liking this question that came into the chat um the q a because this one is gonna eh, we've heard this before on the subject of authentic casting, what are y'all's thoughts on not fitting within the spectrum of your race or ethnicity is supposed to entail? So say, for example, someone who looks Asian American, but was raised in a Hispanic or even a white household and follows those cultural ideals and teachings about them auditioning and being cast in those roles. So my personal belief is that when it comes to like whatever identity, whether it be the Latin identity, the Black identity, the Asian identity, is that like sometimes more often it comes with the expectation that there's like a the notion that this is your culture, like this is what it is. But more often, but this is a very diverse world. So it's like, you know, I, there are plenty of Asians I know who have ra been raised and born in Latin America. Like they are they're culturally la Latin but they're ethnically Chinese or Japanese or Korean, but they do not identify with those Asian cultural values because that's not where they're from. And same with like, you can apply to any ethnicity wherever their country, or even like, you know, Vietnam where it's, I'm, I'm using Vietnam because it's in my mind a lot where it's just like ethnically Chinese, but culturally Vietnamese. And they're in a very like complex identity thing, which I know a lot of cultures and a lot of people who go around can have. I think for me is that like, when it comes to like at what we're here for authentic and representational casting, that it is culture does matter, but I think ethnicity, it plays a big, big, sometimes maybe even a bigger part because it's like, I have projects where it's like, let's say it was like a, a Korean drama and there are Korean actors who never, they were adoptees. They, you know, they don't know anything about Korean values or language or culture. And they would sometimes be like, I don't know if I'm right for this project. And I'm like, well, you are Korean though. And you know, you, you know, that is who you are, even though you may not, you have been raised by white parents, but that is who you are. And so, you know, if you can own that, then yes, you are right for this project because they hired you because you were the right, you were the best actor for this job and you are of that descent. So I think when we see casting language of just like, not just culture, but heritage and descent, 
these are all important words that we need to put in because it's not so much about like cultural values, which does help. Like, you know, when you look at, you know, like a project and you notice it's very culturally based, then it's like hopefully someone in the higher arts, whether the director or the writer or the adapter, understood that there was a very cultural notion in that scene and that needs to be honored. But that is not on the actor to be like, oh shit, I need to know how to translate or I need to know what this cultural value is. That's on the director. That's on the writer and adapter to know what the hell is going on. So I think it's just, it, it's a subjective question, but I think it's like, there are some people who, let's say they're very white passing and they, they have Native American blood in them, but they say, I never identify with Native American cultural values. So I will not say I'm indigenous even though technically I am, even though they'll say I have indigenous blood, which they might, and they may be federally recognized as an indigenous person, but they said, I've lived as a white person all my life. So I will not, I, so I respect those who say that, and I will have no judgment for those who say I do identify as indigenous. It is a personal thing, and this is where it can get very, very messy, where it's just like, where do you draw the line of that? And then I always go, look, in the end, you know, I hope you stick to your integrity and be like, you know, this is who you are. Because when you're dishonest, it will show. It will come through and the world will see it. Absolutely. And I have no problem with putting you on display in front of everybody when you do some trash like that. Thank you so much, Ed. Marcus or Jazzy, you want to add to that? Or we go to the next question. Oh, that was perfect. See, Ed? See, Ed? Ed knows. Ed, Ed knows. knows. <laughs> the only thing I'll even add is just a callback to what Ed said earlier. Yeah. Where, again, we're talking about the ballpark. So the character, let's say, in the casting call, or the character that they wrote is a Korean man that grew up in Honduras or something like that. Like, you might not fit both of those bills, but the ballpark is still there. If you're hitting in the ballpark, cool. Yeah, totally with that. Uh, so a lot of these questions that are coming in are specifically around um, casting and they're giving like, these the different nuances to it. Um, the one that I know that, that um, someone put out on Twitter and they said, okay, um, so you're saying that white v VOs, VA, act VA actors, VA act yeah, voice actors, words are hard, Jazzy, um, you know, shouldn't audition for nor be cast as PGM characters. Um, and we're like, yes, that is true. And then they said, well, so then can um, a black voice actor or a PGM PGM actor be cast in a white role? And the, yep. question, and the answer was, yes, sir. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah. Okay, there listen. My answer for that always is, let's come back and have a converse, have a conversation about that when there are uh, just as many PGM roles as there are white roles. That part. That's that's the that's the answer. That's the only answer. That's the only answer. Because if you look at, and it, again, the, the having diversity, quote unquote, uh, where it's just normal and you have the equal amount of people starts in the creation of a project as well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the base of it. Because most of these projects have majority white characters. Right. Unless it's specifically uh, a show about black kids or, you know, an Asian American show, you know, unless it's specifically a show, you know, like that. It, and it, it shouldn't. Honestly, it's it's weird. But we're trying to catch up, basically. That's 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 the consensus. We're trying to catch up. OK. Yeah. All PGM are. So until all of these projects look like a stroll down the street in real life. We, we don't need to have this discussion. Agreed. And we don't mean a stroll down the street in a small Midwestern town. That's exactly. Uh, my bad. That's, that's, that's my bad. That's my bad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. We're, we're not talking. Yeah. We're not talking about Mayberry. We're not strolling down the street in Mayberry because there was not one black person in Mayberry. <laughs> not a Nam one. None. There was no one of a, of a darker hue. None. Um, completely there. So again, a lot of the questions coming in are like, you know, or some version of this, right? So the, the, the totality of the answer is, because I know we're not, we're not gonna do every single one of the questions that have to do with that, is if, if you have to question it and question what, you're, you're, what you would do, 
then guess what? You already know the answer. Stop asking questions that you already know the answer to. If you have to question and think, oh, I need to go ask a black person, baby. No, you don't. You don't need to go phone a black friend. If you're no, if you don't because you already question know. Question for validation instead of an answer, then you know. Then you know exactly in your heart of hearts. You know, you know. Um, as we talk about accountability, as we talk about holding each other accountable, as we talk about being very vocal, you know, if that is you know within your bandwidth to do and you're comfortable with doing that. Um, one of the questions came in and said, in what ways can we as a community, as creatives, hold one another accountable in public spaces when situations like inauthentic casting are shared across social media? I think we all have some experience with that here. Don't get offended. Please don't, don't let your immediate reaction be anger because somebody's calling you out and trying to help you, like Marcus mentioned earlier, if we are calling you out, it is not of, from a place of hatred, right? If, like at all, we're trying to help you. So if we're saying, hey, um, this really isn't authentic, or this is actually kind of like, you shouldn't do that because it looks really bad. We're not, we're not attacking you. We're acknowledge, you need to acknowledge that this is an issue and you just need to fix it, make some changes, but don't immediately react with anger because one, that comes off wrong. Like, okay, so you knew what you were doing. And again, uh, you wanted validation more than you wanted an actual answer or to fix the problem. So it's like, it's so easy. Have conversations. If you are in a place where you are unsure, like, oh, I would love to write about this culture, but I'm not sure, you can consult people. All of us are more than welcome and are so open about helping you make this project or character authentic. Don't just base something off of judgments and biases that you have about a culture, you know? <laughs> I mean, we've seen enough of that, okay? It's, it's, it's enough, it's enough, guys, I promise. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to offer suggestions to people and accept that information. It's about accepting and acknowledging that this is happening. Like you need to do something and you need to make a change. And I think if you're going to do something, if you are going to do something publicly, then I'm going to address it publicly. If you do something privately, then I'm going to address it privately. Um, if you disrespect me in public, I expect my apology to be public, right? Um, so, cause the question came in about, you know, what are the thoughts on publicly calling someone out versus privacy, privately calling someone out? If you put up like what happened last week, if you put up that you are now cast as a role, as a white woman, as a black God, and you put that out there publicly, I don't need to talk to you privately about that. You publicly did it. You knew what you were doing and you were public about it. I'm going to publicly say, Hey, Hey, no, on, in, on no shape or form or fashion. Is that okay? Right. Um, and I think maybe sometimes that maybe if you have a relationship with somebody, a, you know, a close relationship, then yeah, you know, you might pull them aside and go, Hey, Hey, I need to talk to you about the things that you are putting on the internet. You are all over blue Ivy's internet out here wilding. Can we talk about that? Well, I don't want to talk about it. Well, all right then. Well, they finna drag you for filth and I'm going to sit back and watch. I still love you though. Okay. Love you. Bye-bye. Y'all be good. God bless. And keep moving. That, and not everybody is okay with receiving a DM. Exactly. It's a private space, text message, DM, Discord message, whatever. Not everyone is going to be open to that. Some people don't even have DMs open. Right. So sometimes it's not even an option. But like you said, if it's public, it's okay to publicly call it out. But at the same time, whenever you publicly call it out, it's not, in my mind, it's not for only that person. It's for everyone else everybody. watching too. That piece, because you can't, the things that are done in the dark, they have to come to light. We have to have these hard discussions. It's not about having private discussions anymore. There is too many conversations that happen in private, which is why we are where we are. Mm -hmm. Awesome. How do you prevent, re prevent reverse burnout, whether it is actively combating racism and prejudice in the workspace or searching for new jobs while subconsciously comparing ourselves to our white working peers? That is an amazing question. Y'all, uh, PGM imposter syndrome is real. Imposter syndrome as a PGM is very real. 
um, my God. Okay. Look to feel like you have to be twice as good just to compare to the average white person is stressful and it's very hard. Um, I, <laughs> y'all self-care again, don't carry too much. Self-care is the best care. You got to take care of yourself. Um, at the end of the day, what is it? Uh, RuPaul, how the hell you, <laughs> if you don't how love yourself, you how the it. hell you gonna love somebody else? Right. So mm -hmm. take care of yourself. Uh, it, be it if you, however that work looks like for you, because it's different for everybody. Take breaks. Me, I like, go and take a nap or like mm -hmm. I'll binge watch a show out of pure like I just need to unplug for a minute or play video games for like yeah two hours but it's like it looks different for everybody so just make sure that you do what you need to do because at the end of the day as a PGM as any kind of diversity person you are always on an uphill battle when you are going for jobs when you are auditioning be it if you publicly advocate or not, you are always on an uphill battle. So the stress of this industry weighs on us so much more than our white counterparts. Absolutely. So please take care of yourself. Absolutely. And even those of us who have what they call ethnic names. My name is Tanisha. And I've seen not give jobs. And I've sent the exact same resume with T. Nicole on it versus Tanisha on it. And all of a sudden I get a phone call. From a, from a client that rejected me the first time because my name is Tanisha. You know, so you, you, you're walking in the door behind the eight ball to begin with. So yes, you have to pour into yourself. You cannot pour into others from an empty pitcher. Pour into yourself. And if that means that you take a step away from social media, then do that. If you want to deactivate your profile for a while, do that. Go outside, take a walk. If it's too hot like it is here in Houston, you know, then just go sit in the AC. You know, just get in the room and turn the AC down to 68 and just shiver a little bit and you'll feel a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it, absolutely, it's about you taking care of yourselves um, and realize that this is not a fight that is going to be won overnight. We didn't get here overnight. We cannot get to where we need to be, but what we can do is try to bridge that gap, right? Um, it's important to listen to your body. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, no, 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 come with it. Yeah, it's important to listen to your body. 99 times out of 100, your body's going to let you know when you're getting burned out. Mm -hmm. So if you even feel like an inkling of like, man, I might, I might be getting burned out. Yes, you are. You are. You're thinking that because it's actively happening. Take a break, man. Take a step back. Because I promise you as well, if you just try to keep pushing through and overstrain yourself, your work is going to reflect that. Yeah. There have been times where I've been like fighting allergies or a sinus infection. Like right now, I've been fighting it. I didn't record today. This morning, I said to myself, I'm like, well, I need to get some recording done. I, need to, I got this audio book I'm working on. But then I promise you, if I go back and listen to whatever chapters I recorded today, I'm going to be like, man, you can tell I was feeling bad. You can hear it in your performances. So yeah. it's good to push yourself. It's not good to push yourself too far. Good. Fantastic. So one of the questions that comes up, um, and we talked about this, uh, when we talked about the, the casting companies and we talked about money, what is their response to studios not wanting to sacrifice their reputation for the sake of, quote, staying out of it? <laughs> Come on in, I'm looking at you. This also applies not just to studios, but uh, definitely for actors or people who definitely are, who have like, a very influential position, whether it be the number of followers they have, at some point it gets to the point where they start to act like corporations, where everything they say needs to be monitored and needs to be very safe. I get it. Like, it's like you get like 3 million followers, anything you say or do will be scrutinized. So it's like whatever you could, you were able to say, as opposed to like you had like what, a, a hundred followers or 200 followers. That was like freedom. You could say whatever the hell you wanted, and it was like woohoo. But once you get to that point, or and or your corporation, and they want to stay out of it, oh man, um, I'm trying to see from both perspectives. It's like I think corporations do need to stand up more to what they think is right. But then it's kind of like you know I have to uh, I have to go back and look at it where it's like it's not just one person. There are shareholders. 
there's a board committee there are like you know all these people involved so whatever you say reflects every single employee and executives that are of that company so it's kind of like what can you do in that position and i think it's just like as individuals who have large followings as corporations yes you know you have to choose your battles very carefully i get that but i think you also have to realize because you are of an influential position you have all these people who are looking at you you have power and i think it's like you know when you have the ability to shift the needle to make change and that's you know the same argument can be applied to like me you look at the billionaires of this world they have the power to change the world as we see it overnight but they don't do it and i know everyone's like oh why don't you just do this and you have and you know sometimes you have to factor in what are they you know what are they doing over there that kind of thing and the same thing with corporations and people so i think it's just like it's my final answer is corporations should have the courage and people to speak on what they believe is right just do it because i think we are in a world where it's like everyone's afraid to say the wrong thing and i get it but it's just like you know if this world was based on like what you believe is right for the betterment of humanity to, to you know in, we're not talking about things where it's like you know restricting you know like this this we're talking about like improving the lives of others just say it and i know this is, i know i'm gonna have a bunch of people who suits who be like oh you know it's a lot harder than that i get it but just have the courage to do it whether you do have a million followers or you just have 200, you can start now. When people say you don't, I don't have the influence. I don't have the, the position to make any change. But I know plenty of people who have very little followers or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's good. You start there and keep going. Never stop. Because I think it's very sad to see when people, I, can, I, I see some people I know that transition almost overnight. Like once they achieve that fame, that success, they become very like bland, very like safe. And I can't fault you for it, but I feel sad because you now became safe. And I think it's okay. just like, you know, just have the courage to speak on what you think is right. Because in the end, this life is very short. And as we've seen with many people in our community, some who have recently passed away, uh, that life is very short. So very what pleasing. do you want to do with it? If you want to yeah. be safe? Okay, I have no judgment if you do. Or do you want to make a difference in every little thing you say or do or things you contribute to? And I think if we can all have that, it does make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think life is entirely too fleeting as we have seen for to be unfulfilled and unhappy. Um, if you want to take the safe bet and you want to hedge your bets and hey, you, you, do, you do you, that is absolutely a choice, but it's also a choice that you have to live with. And do you want to leave this realm of existence knowing that you could have done better, that you could have tried more and live with that kind of regret, especially when you see other people within the community hurting and being hurt by the things that you are refusing to speak out against because you want to play it safe. Safe is not always the answer. It may be the answer that you choose. I'm not saying it in that particular thing. You do what you feel is right for you, but you know what's right and what's wrong. It's, it's, it's a very, very firm line in the sand, right? Um, I wanted to say, I think, <laughs> I always like to compare it uh, to the movie, um, A Bug's Life. Um, I love that the community movie. doesn't realize the power it has in its hands because everyone's so self-focused. We're all the ants. And these big corporations and, and people in power are the grasshoppers. If we all get on the same page, if we can all support each other, the sheer numbers alone, we may not have the clout, we may not have the follower count or whatever, but we have the numbers. We can all help each other. And I have seen the voice acting community be the most supportive community I've ever seen, but to see that crumble for clout, y'all, come on. They do anything like, for clout. Anything for clout. If we literally, so much could happen if all of us get on the same page. It's literally all it takes. We have the power, guys. It doesn't take much. 
clout thing too. You got to think if a corporation or a company or somebody is willing to stand up for what's right, how much more willing are you going to be able to frequent them or buy their product? Like if I see a company doing some dope shit, doing some like actual advocating, doing some actual work, I am 99% more likely to support them, to buy their product, to take part in their goods and services. And that's, that's a clout within itself. So it's got to, Everything you do to generate clout, who are you generating the clout with? That's yeah. the important question you need. Who are you trying to impress? And is it really somebody that you want to be impressing? Exactly. And like with the life is short thing, life is short, but it's also the longest thing you will ever do. So make it worth it. If you don't come through, Marcus, if you don't come through, you know, I, mm, I love y'all. We have 20 minutes left. Um, there's some questions that, you know, come up, some may be a little bit redundant. So I was answering and typing those. So it's not that I'm not paying attention, y'all. I am listening and I'm typing at the same time. Um, there's one in here. So there's, I'm going to do a, there's a, I'm going to do a twofer. Okay. So there's two questions in here and both of them have to do with accents and authentic reads. Okay. So, um, one question is, you know, when auditioning, it says for an ethnic character, um, if the specs don't specify whether the character has an accent or not, what is the best approach? That's one, one piece, okay? Um, and then the second one is when we talk about monoliths, right? And so these questions are very much related. Um, when it comes to black female voices the, on these casting specs, where we see, oh, it has to be Regina King or Venus, or it has to be Viola Davis. It's Tiffany Haddish every time. I Tiffany swear Haddish. to you, it's Tiffany Haddish every time. Yes, I have seen them. And, and so it's like, okay, it can be disruptive to, to an authentic read, right? So then the panelists are asking, how do we respond to agents and casting directors who ask for these one note descriptions? Um, how do we push back on that? I will say, prefacing that before you answer, I got a, a, I booked a, a regional commercial and they said, oh, they want an urban read. And this is my face. You want urban? So my response back to my production company was, can you please advise as to what is meant by urban read? It took them several hours to come back to me. And it was the client says they just want a cool, you know, a relax, cool, relaxed read. I said, okay, thank you. I will do things and I'll get everything uploaded. Because if they had come back with anything, anything along the lines of urban and started giving, you know, let's say, you know, Tiffany Hatch or things like that, it was going to be, you need to put, you need to book somebody else for this. I am not going to be a stereotype. I'm not going to do that. And if you decide that you don't want me on your books anymore, Okay, boo boo, feel free, take me off. I'm good. Trust me, I will find other work. So, question is what do you do when you're auditioning for a character that is of a specific ethnicity, but the specs don't specify whether the character has an accent or not? And then, well, how do we address um, when we are given certain examples in regards to how they want their read? I'm gonna I want to start no, with you. I Jennifer. just, I just want to show my shirt first, and then I'm gonna let somebody go first because I, I got, some, I definitely have some things to say, but I don't know if I'm gonna do this right. But oh yeah, can y'all see it? I don't know. I says, I'm, I am black, so I always sound black. Amen. Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. That's it. But please, somebody go ahead and start. <laughs> Marcus, Ed. Uh, for me personally, I just read it close to how I naturally talk. So if it does not specify an accent, if so for me, oh, this character is biracial. Goes back to that, like, well, how? If they just say, oh, this character is black and white. I'm black and white. Okay, I'm just going to talk how I talk. That's the accent I'm going to give it. Now, if they tell me, if they come back later and they say, oh, well, this guy actually has more of a Southern accent. Okay, I'm happy to kind of provide that. Or oh, this guy's kind of more of like East Coast or a lot a lot of what I'll get because um, my agency is based out of Chicago. I'll get a lot of the, like, they want the kind of stereotypical Chicago accent with, like, the drawn out Chicago kind of thing. I'm happy to provide that. But if they come to me and they say this character is mixed, we want them to sound blacker. 
What the fuck does that mean? What does blacker sound like? What sound in your head is black? I would like to know. And then address your own prejudices. And then ask them to do it. Tell me what, tell me what you hear yeah. in your head. Pull Give the William example, Shatner. Please. Do, pull the William Shatner. You, have you heard that when he was on, when he's actually was in a uh, studio? For those of you who don't know, um, you can look up William Shatner like rant in the studio. And somebody's always oh, then somebody's like, well, no, do it for me. No, no, I want you to do it for me so that I can hear what it is that you want me to do. And it will stop people cold in their tracks. It needs to be blacker. It, can you do it for me? I, I want to, you know, make sure that I'm hitting what it is that you're asking me to do and watch them sit there and squirm. Oh, well, well, no, you just do it the way you want to. No, but you said, I'm just trying to make sure you, Mr. Client, get what you need. And that's also part of me being petty. And then also, if they come at you with those like one notes where they say, oh, we want this character and they're this ethnicity, and we have three exact examples of that ethnicity, and those are the only three people we know. If I'm ever met with that, genuinely what I will do is I will just make my voice deeper or higher, and that's it. That's all I will change. I like that. And then that. come back to me about it. If I don't get the role, fine, but I am not corrupting my integrity to pander to you. Yeah. Ed? Everything Marcus said, uh, I do have a very, very humbling experience where it was for an on camera role and for a Korean character, and there was no mention of any accent required. And I gave them two takes. And one without the accent. And then the second take, I shouldn't have done it. I gave them the Korean accent take. And lo and behold, they took the accent take. So when I was booked for a role, they wanted me to do the accent. And so I did the accent. And then the feedback from the directors, can you make it thicker? And then I realized I put myself in this situation. I have dug my own grave at this. And I used that situation, that incident as a learning experience. This was over a decade ago when this happened that I would never do something like that. I would never give them that option. So if they're saying ethnic character, don't give them that option. If you are comfortable with though, you're like, I have no problem with doing that. Great. But if you are like, I don't want to play a stereotype. I don't want to do an accent. Don't give them that. Now, let's say you book that role. And then like, you know, kind of like what Marcus experience is like, oh, can you do that accent? Look, if you genuinely can do it and you have no problem, then go for it. What I do nowadays where it's like, oh, can you give us a thick Asian accent? One, I'll go, what kind of accent, what kind of Asian are you talking about? It's a lot of Asians there. And two, if I generally don't feel like it, I'll just go, I don't know how to do the accent. And then they just, there's, I've had that once for a voiceover job and we kind of just stared at each other and I was like, I, just, I don't know how to do it. And they're like, oh, but you are, uh, and then they couldn't finish their sentence. And I was like, I'll just, I can do a higher pitch voice. They're like, hey, okay, fine, we'll do that. So it was just like you, you know, it's funny. As an actor, you actually have more power than you think you do. You create the maze for them. Don't give them options. Like, you stick with that. And they go, well, can you do this? And then, uh, you know, just say no. Because, and if they go, well, well, okay, you're being very hard to work with. I'm like, all right, tough. And? The end. Okay. Like you like that's like I'm gonna say that's the bad thing. Um something just came through and it, it's right in the same vein as this. And so I want to get y'all's opinions on it. So it says, um, I received this last month $250 anim animatic VO, African American woman of color only. Side note, I only divide my roster by male and female, not by race or age, although I do have a Brit group because you know that accent. And truthfully, do you prefer I say a quote black voice? I know our advertising world gets very specific and targeted. So please tell me what is the most used in this realm. I'd rather be real than speak corporate ease. Thank you. Um, there is no such thing as a black voice. My voice is my voice. My Refer voice my to voice. shirt. <laughs> yes. I am black. I am what, black. What I am black, black identifying. Voice. I am black. Yeah. So whatever voice I give you is a black voice. Whatever voice Jazzy gives you is a black voice. There yeah that's 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 a hard full stop no cap and i know that comes across a bit harsh but it's meant to right um and somebody else said well what does urban mean and she said i'm indian i'm not understanding what urban and i put into the i typed out this that urban is meant a lot of times as a stereotype of what they think black people are supposed to sound like that we're supposed to be ghetto 
that we're supposed to speak in broken English, um, that we use a lot of slang, um, and that we're loud and boisterous and just intrusive. And that is a stereotype. And many a person within Hollywood have made millions of dollars using that trope, but it is not one that we want to continue to do because it does a disservice to the community as a whole. I hope that answers, answers your question. Um, you're probably thinking, that don't quite answer my question. I get it, but this is how we dismantle prejudices by flat out saying, my voice is my voice. Yeah, and it's- We're oh. not saying this to sound, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, and Speak up a little bit, Marcus, your, your, your audio is going out a little bit. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a, it's a little low. Okay, let me turn myself up a bit here, I'm sorry. Is this better? No, it's the same. Is this better? <laughs> there it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, none of what we're saying comes from a place of hatred, like we said earlier. Right. So you may not get the answer that you're looking for here because there's not a good answer. The way the question is framed, there's not a way that it can be answered. There's no such thing as a quote unquote black voice. There are multiple different black people. Everybody sounds different. Every vo everybody's voice is their own voice. So if you say a black voice, well, Donald Glover's a black man. He has a black voice, but he doesn't sound like Lance Reddick. So when you say you're looking for a black voice, really think to yourself, what am I saying here? What am I actually looking for? Um, yeah, I, I was just gonna basically what Marcus said, but it's, there's a difference between asking for a black voice and an accent, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like asking for a South, uh, Southeast Asian, words, Southeast Asian voice or a Southeast Asian accent. There is nothing wrong with asking for accents from the beginning. If there, it was like, this is someone who just, you know, migrated from that, this area, this particular area. So they still do have an accent when, you know, speaking there, it's totally okay. It's, it's not like we're saying no accents allowed. Right. Um, but, you know, saying, uh, to refer to the original question, you know, if they, they don't specify an accent, if the character is saying, yes, this is a Southeast Asian character, if you as a Southeast Asian, say that five times fast, oh my gosh, um, if you are of that ethnicity and if you have a natural accent, use it. I say audition with it. If you want to do two takes uh, and have one that is a general American accent, if you can do that, then do it. But if you are Southeast Asian, so you always sound Southeast Asian because that's who you are as a person. It's not your voice, it's not a voice. You know what I mean? Our ethnicities are not a voice. Those are the biases behind them from people on the outside. So if they're, yes, we're looking for an Indian voice. No, you're looking for an Indian uh, voice actor for this Indian character. I just happen to have a natural Indian accent, so that's what I'm going to audition with. Or if you are Indian and you don't have that accent and you speak general American, then use that voice. But it's not, it's not any less Indian because you don't have an accent. You're still Indian. So if it doesn't specify accent, whatever your accent is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and somebody asked in the chat, you know, is requesting AAVE or for those who don't know what AAV is, it's African-American vernacular English, the dialect, just a veiled attempt at perpetu or perpetuating stereotypes or is it a reasonable request of the creators if they hear AAVE in their head for the character? And I told the person, I said, absolutely, that it is perpetuating a stereotype unless it is a genuine dialogue between characters. It's about the authenticity. And I'm sorry, there should not be a non-person, a non-Black person writing AAVE in their scripts and things of that nature. It's AAVE, African American Vernacular English. And it's from the South, it's not from the North. There's a difference as to how that happens, right? So it's a little bit more, it's more nuanced to it than that, but just absolutely. We have 
six minutes left and there are four open questions. Um, I did want to say I'm okay going with five minutes. I know we started a little late, so yeah, we did. I'm going a little over. Okay. I also see Sterling's hand up in the chat. Oh, um, there's a chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah, or not the chat, but yes, there's a the Sterling's hand. Up. Okay. Yes. Um, Ed, um, you want me to get through, let's get through these here that, are, that came in before that. And then Ed, if you could um, permit him to talk once we get to these here, because I think his hand came in after these. Yeah, these I think he also chat. might have actually wrote the question he too did? at the bottom. Oh, there it is. There it is. Absolutely. Okay. Here we go. All righty. So it is one of our questions here. So let me get through these. And then so that gives us four questions and that should actually probably put us at time. All righty. Um, so... JP from Queer Vox, um, one loves the entire panel. Yay, we appreciate that, thank you. Um, and so the question is, when it comes to that bleh, and bleh is put into you know quotes, general question of quote, seeking diverse casting, how do we avoid the pissing contest of the deserving? As in pitting black cis versus white trans actors who deserves the role more and then they fight over it, especially in situations where the casting is annoyingly vague. Anybody? Going once? I'll, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, All right. I think it comes down to, and you, you kind of follow, you kind of answered this for me with your, the bit of the follow up, the tagline at the end, or not tagline, but you know what I mean? Where I would say it comes down to what does it say for that character in the casting call? Like, how is this character described? But if it's, in, if it's vague, then. I, I, I kind of don't understand where the pissing contest would come in because if it's vague, if it just says a black man, it doesn't say a cis black man or anything like that, then it, to me, that's equal footing. I don't know how, it, how someone else would be more deserving. If the two people auditioning are both black, then that's it. They, they, they hit that ballpark criteria. I don't know how a pissing contest would come in there. So I might not be answering the question exactly, but to me, there shouldn't be one. It's just, they're both black men auditioning for the character of a black man. Who's better gets it. Yeah. And I think this is definitely referring to like the character side of voiceover. Um, because when it's like, when you look at commercial, you know, uh, uh, audition specs, you know, when they're, what they're looking for and they're just like, it's open. We don't care. Um, yeah, I don't see, I, I, I personally wouldn't see where the, the contest would be, um, because unless they say it in their audition that they are specifically like, a check off a diversity box, um, those hearing the auditions wouldn't know. And I feel like if it, in reference to characters, like if it is like a character casting call, maybe they don't have a character designing it. They just like, I just know that the personality is going to be like this and they're either going to be male or female. You know, if that's really it. Um, again, I don't, I don't think unless they publicly put it out there in their audition. Um, I, I, I personally don't see where the, the contest would be either. And again, could be wrong. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I think voice actors would have to purposely make it a contest by being like, hey, I check off this diversity box. You want to hire me, if that, if that makes sense. Now, un unless the character spec does say, like, if it's vague and just says this is a Black person, or if it's specific and says this is a Black trans femme, mm. it should go to a Black trans femme. 100%. No pissing contest. It's just... <laughs> It should go to a black trans fan. That's it. But if yeah, if they're just looking for, uh, I haven't I haven't seen a casting call like that where they're just like just looking for diverse talent. Um, that's that's hard. That's a hard call. I'd just be like, yeah, I'm just I'm just a DGF. I, don't... I think I'll answer this because I see JP uh, would clarify. So it's it is actually something I said earlier about that casting director. Uh, where it's like, I, you know, I want to claim claim diversity, even though I'm white, by being someone of LGBTQ community. Um, that's, that's what the pissing contest is. It's like, you know, when it comes to like, uh, white actors who are of the LGBTQ community, and like, global majority actors. And I think 
this is something where it's like I, I I see this not as a pissing contest. I see arguments happen a lot between that because it's like we are all you know all technically we're all what the mainstream corporation calls diverse. That's what we are. Like whether you are LGBTQ or you're a global majority or you're both. Like we're all in this very messy diverse umbrella, and so I think when I think what it is is just like. I, that's why I didn't have a response for that casting director where it was just like, I didn't feel easy with it, but I wasn't like, oh, that's fucked up to say anything like that. Cause it's just like, it's, I had to come to terms that it is very messy. Like she is of that community, the LGBTQ community. And so it's like, no, you have to acknowledge that. So it's just like, but at the same time, as some people have said, like, you know, in the end, whiteness comes first. Like you will see that that will be the privilege and yes there are this you know there are bias and prejudice and hate crimes against lgbtq community regardless if you're white or whatever ethnicity you are but you are white first and foremost and that comes with privilege that none of us here will have and i think it's 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 a messy and very very specific conversation but it is something worth having when some people are saying oh i'm losing opportunities because of all these black actors but then if you point, call them out and they say, oh, well, I am of the LGBT community, so I'm also discriminated. And then, okay, and then you have to be very, like, hold the line be like, okay, we're not talking about you being of gay or LGBTQ. We're talking about you being white and you're complaining that Black actors are getting jobs. So let's just talk about that. Yeah. Like, let's not try to, like, bleed into, like, like as JP said, a pissing contest because that's the last thing we want. You could because, what end, because it's like you know i always think like there's a quote from harvey milk it's like you know way way back when he was in office that if the the lgbtq community like you know collaborate with the asians and the blacks we would become unstoppable like because if we can all agree that our enemy is the mainstream our enemy is like the status quo the hetero white cis male power structure that is our focus but we get so caught up in these little arguments and discussions amongst ourselves that, you know, that's why I do with, like the casting director. Like, this is not a battle worth having. Like, it's fine. I may feel uncomfortable, but, but I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, that's what it is. Like we said, try to be like, okay, a battle for another day. What is the bigger picture at hand? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, that's where I, that's where I feel. We're ants, guys. We're ants. Uh, but, um, I wanted to say that I think what's important is just because you can see, a, like, you can see white, right? You can see white versus, you know, the LGBTQIA. You can't tell that off the bat, right? So the conflict is when is that card being pulled? So in reference to the Moriarty anime incident, uh, there were people that said, you know, maybe some people aren't ready to be open about their status, which is totally fine. Right. But in a world of everybody sees you and where authenticity is so important, if you are trans, you should be openly trans to audition for characters that are open or that are also trans because, oh, it, I can't remember, but a voice actor made a video addressing that incident and they said, you know, it's great in the future if you do come out, but what matters now is this moment. As of this moment, you are not openly trans, so you are a cis person that is playing a trans character. It doesn't matter if you do come out in the future, but that's what it is now. Rep yes, representation is super important. So it doesn't matter if you come out later, what are you now? Are you open about this? And if you're not, if you're not ready to be open, you shouldn't audition for these roles and you shouldn't do these roles. So it's, I think the, the conflict would be, when are they openly diverse? Because unlike ethnicity, you don't have to be open about it. So if a situation happens, we're like, okay, we're, we're looking to you know cast more diversely and because they don't wanna lose their job, then they come out with it. it, it, it it's. It's kind of hard.
harmful for one, the community itself, because it's like, well, you know, I'm only going to, I'm going to use the community to, you know, win in the situation, you know, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I saw a whole video breakdown of somebody who was a streamer who was pretending to be disabled in a wheelchair. And there was an incident where they left their camera on and he stood up and walked away. No, no, no joke. No joke. No, ma'am. No joke. So don't use communities for your benefit. You can't prove it. So that, and, 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 I think it's so harmful to the community because if you like, oh, well, actually I'm by, are you? Because you're saying it now in a moment where you're under pressure and we don't, nobody wants to question a community like that. Yes. That's not okay. You are giving them a bad name. That's not okay. Representation is important. And again, not everybody can afford to be open. Not everybody can afford to advocate. So don't do things that would put you in that situation. If you are not trans or you're not open about it yet, don't do things that would put you out in the open. I think, I think that's the biggest conflict. Yes. I ranted, so I apologize. You know, this is what we're here for. Um, we have time for, I think, one more. And this actually is specifically for Marcus. Um, he says, Starling said this has already been somewhat answered, but he says as a biracial person himself, he would like to know a little bit more about your perspective, Marcus, and of course thoughts of the rest of our panelists on being biracial or mixed ethnicity and auditioning for roles. What is your general personal experience and you know, what, if any la limits or allowances do you provide yourself? Limits and allowances, I'd say it boils down to that auth authenticity. Can I portray the role accurately? Um, now I have auditioned for white roles. I've auditioned for black roles. I'm not going to audition for, like I said earlier, if the role is a Southeast Asian man, I'm not auditioning for that. If the role is, <clears throat> excuse me, if the role is for a Latin American man, I'm not auditioning for that. I'm like Ed said, kind of that ballpark thing. I'm going to try and fit in that ballpark somewhere. Now, if it's a character, like, let's say, because even within that spectrum, there are some things that I won't fit and I'm not going to be able to portray accurately. So, yes, I will audition for Black characters, but I'm not auditioning for a Black character that's from West Africa. I can't, I can't portray that. That's not something I can do. Um, and so it's really just having that honest conversation about yourself because, and I, and I hate to do this cliché, when it comes to biracial people and it's, we do travel that line of living in two worlds. And I, I hate when people say that I hate it, but it's true. So you have to just be real with yourself, find that dichotomy of what fits and what doesn't be true to yourself and say, can I accurately do this? If the answer is no, take a step back, man. No one's going to fault you for backing out of something that you don't think you can do. It's about I, I being hope that honest. answers the question. No, yeah. I think it absolutely does. It's about being honest with yourself. And mm -hmm. it's hard to be honest with yourself when you don't know who you are. One of my acting coaches, I think um, I was with Everett Oliver one time, and he was like, you have to know who you are before you walk into that booth, before you're able to put part of you into a character, into an audition. You have to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, then how can you portray something you don't know? You don't know who you are, so you have to be really confident in yourself and in who you are, what you are, where you are, and what you are and are not willing to do. Um, without that, if people are always oh, just acting, yeah, but you have to have something to pull from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what acting is. You have to have something to pull from. Like, oh, I get to play different people. Yes, but in every character that you are portraying, there is a piece of you, some part of experience, some emotional you know, trauma that you went through or whatever that you're able to put into that character to make them that much more authentic and that they resonate with, you know, the listener in this case or, you know, whoever is on the screen who's watching. So it's about, again, go back to Mark, but authenticity. You got to know who you are. And um, something I just oh. thought of uh, that comes up, I'm, I'm sorry, Jazzy, just uh, real quick. Whenever it comes to biracial characters that you might not fit the boxes for, so... If, if it's a biracial character that's 
black and Lebanese. I'm not auditioning for that. I I don't think I could accurately portray that. I'm not going to do it. If it's a character that's white and Latin American, I'm not going to audition for that. Yes, I am mixed. Yes, the casting call says mixed or biracial, but boils down to being true to yourself. I can't portray that. Now, if you have a casting call for a biracial character that's white and black, or even better yet, if you if y'all find a casting call for a German Jewish black guy, please let me know. I'm all over it. <laughs> I'm auditioning for those, but you're gonna be perfect for it. <laughs> but for biracial characters, it's what you fit and what you can authentically portray and being true to yourself. And sorry, same. Tansy, go ahead. No, yeah, same. Uh, I'm actually also biracial. My mom is white and black and my father is black. Um, so my mom is, my mom is white passing my, her whole, basically her whole family is white passing and, uh, we're from Montana. Okay. Y'all, I was the only black kid in my neighborhood. So it's funny when I come back and they're like, Oh, remember when you were this little, I'm like, of course you do. I was the only Brown one in this town. Okay. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's the same thing, right? Like I, I won't audition for something that's black mixed a uh, biracial character that's black and like, um, Lebanese to use Marcus's example, cause I'm bad. Um, I won't do that because I can't portray both sides of that. Um, I'll do black characters that are straight black because I can compare to that experience um, and, and things like that. So yes, unless you can, off, yeah, it's about being true to yourself, the authenticity behind it. Um, I won't do uh, African characters um, if they, because I cannot relate to that experience even though I am black, I am not African. So. You just touched on that. And that's, I think people, and then not all people from Africa are the same. There are 50 countries within Africa and having a Nigerian accent is different than having an Ethiopian accent is different than having an Egyptian accent is different than having a Zimbabwean accent than Tanzania. The Africa is not a monolith period, point blank. And the African-American experience, the experience of a black person in America is going to be different than the experience of someone who is from the continent, not country, continent of Africa, and also different from immigrants who are coming from the different, con different countries of Africa. The experience is different. So again, slice and dice, people, oh, it's too complicated. Yes, life is complicated and it's messy, deal with it. Um, with that, guess what, everybody? It has been an amazing, amazing two hours. We have ticked some people off. My phone has been going off with all these Twitter notifications. I'm trying to think, ooh, who's going to slide to my DMs today? Let's have a look-see. Um, thank you all for being very vulnerable. Thank you for being transparent. Thank you for being willing to put yourself out there because when you have these types of conversations, when you have these types of issues and you bring up and you're vocal about them, it does make you a bit of a target. You have a target on your back now. Um, if you didn't already have that before, but you know what? You want somebody to shoot at, come shoot at me. We'll have these conversations. I think all of us here, we are now accomplices. There's a difference between an ally and accomplices, right? Um, an accomplice is somebody's gonna get down in the dirt with you and is gonna sacrifice as much as you're sacrificing. An ally is like, oh, I feel for you. Here, I can try to help until it gets to be uncomfortable or it costs them something. But an accomplice, y'all getting charged together. If one of you going down, we all going down. And also, if someone needs called out and you don't have the energy for it, put me in, coach. Yeah, we're, we're here for y'all. We're here to fight for you. We, yeah. again, advocacy is a privilege. We understand that. And we're willing to do what we need to to help y'all out. Um, I don't care about clout. I'll jump in. Yeah, it's same. Like we just <laughs> we just want y'all to not fight against us. That's all we're yeah. asking. That's that's all. That's all. <laughs> any, that's all it is. any closing or parting thoughts before we log off this Sunday evening that is also Juneteenth and Father's Day? Do you want to start? Thank you for being <laughs> here. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Yeah. Thank you.
Um, obviously, oh, this is just, you know, this can keep going on. This is obviously, this is not a one all be all like conversation. All right, we're, we're settled. All right, this is good. This is going to be a continuing conversation that we'll have for many years. So, but at the very least, just like, you know, I, you know, thank you all for being part of this. And I think, you know, we all can play a part in terms of making a difference, in terms of calling out things that, you know, needs to be called out, uh, choosing your battles. And then more importantly, like Jazzy said, taking a break, like taking care of yourself. Not every battle needs to be fought every single day. And if you can, you know, amazing. But if you need to rest and it takes some time to rest, do so. Your mental health and your physical health is most important. Mm -hmm. Freaking movie. And with that, we thank you all. We wish you and bid you all a good night. We know it's late for our East Coast family and maybe some <laughs> folks that are overseas because we did have a couple folks that were um, with us in an international group. So thank you all so much. Um, be good. Make good choices. And uh, keep fighting the fight, y'all. Have a good night. <laughs>